This is 2OF Entertainment. Everybody is telling you to move to electric cars, but should you? Are they the right car for you or should you look at hybrids? If you're looking at hybrids, what sort of hybrids should you look at? And if you don't want to look at hybrids and you don't want to look at electric, is there still an opportunity to look for petrol? Is there still an opportunity to look for diesel? I'm going to break it down for you in this video, so stay tuned and I'll explain everything and try to help you decide what is the right car for you right after this. A brown car guy. So let's start with electric because those obviously are the cars at the moment. Um, that's the one that everybody's talking about. People want us to get into electric cars. Uh, governments and policymakers are trying to legislate us into electric cars. Are they right for you? Well, you know, one of the things about electric cars is that they're really quite good now. You know, um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions. I'm not going to go into all of those right now, but just to briefly touch on them, they are far, far, far less likely to self-combust than you think they are, than everybody says they are. Uh, the most likely vehicles to self-combust, actually, or to catch fire, are hybrids. This is according to data and stats. And petrol cars and electric comes very distant, distant um, third. But the problem is that if they do catch fire, then it's pretty spectacular and almost impossible, well, virtually impossible to put out. In fact, what a lot of people, a lot of the, um, the rescue services, fire services now tend to do, is to just let them burn out because that's just the easiest way to deal with it. And when there's nothing left, then you can just scrape it off the floor and, and get rid of it. So um, that's a myth. The other myths are about, you know, I'm not going to talk, like I said, not get too much into it, but all the discussion about where it comes from, are they environment friendly? You know, I've covered all that in other videos, so I won't get too much into that. What I want to talk about here is, is it right for you? And I think that the way things are at the moment, the cars themselves are actually brilliant. They're really, really good. I've reviewed a lot of electric cars. Um, you can see that I've got a whole playlist of them on here. You can check them out. Some of them are now my favorite cars. It's a BMW i4 M50. Oh. I would, it's expensive, but I would have that. It's such an awesome car. For some reason, I'm walking along a skate park, so um, if I trip up, you'll know why. Anyway, it's an awesome car. So the cars are getting really, really good. Really good to drive. Um, it's in some cases, actually quite enjoyable. Certainly, the performance is fantastic, and the ranges are getting better and better and more and more usable. So all of that is good. All of that is good. Now, is it right for you? Should you get one? I would say that depends on your circumstances. First of all, they are expensive, but um, there is a situation where you can buy them as a company car and get certain tax incentives. Keep in mind that some of the traditional advantages or tax benefits of having EVs is being eroded. So for example, they will be subject to VED, road tax, vehicle exercise, excise duty um, from 2025. That's happening. In addition to that, if you're in London, if you live in central London, um, well, if you're around London and you have an EV and you think, I can drive into the congestion charging zone because I've registered it, that goes away from, yeah, I'm not doing that. That goes away from December the 25th of uh, 2025. So that will go away as well. So those are going away. The only real, and of course, there's no subsidies or anything like that. So the only real thing that you've got then is the BIK, benefit in kind tax advantage that you get if you buy as a company car. And therefore, it's not a surprise that most of the sales of EVs that are currently happening are actually um, company sales, fleet, fleet car sales, and not so much private sales because people are buying them as company cars. So that makes sense. So if you have that facility, you're able to buy it like that, then yes, it could benefit you financially. So then you should definitely look at it and look at it as something that you might want to do. Now, in terms of the daily realities of the EV, if most of your driving is around town, particularly if you're in a busy metropolis, they're actually really good. Uh, and again, another misconception about EVs is about the range. Now, range you also have to keep in mind that range that manufacturers quote 
is not the real world range that you'll get. You can take 30% off that easily. Having said that, it varies quite, it fluctuates quite a bit. So for example, if you're somebody that does a lot of motorway miles, then you're not going to see anywhere near that range because the more sustained high speed driving that you do on your EV, the quicker you will drain the battery. So they don't do really well on that. I mean, you can mitigate it in certain ways um, by tempering your driving. I'm not going to get into that right now, but there's, you know, there's ways you could do it. But the reality is that they don't perform that well. Where they do perform well is around town. Where they perform particularly well is in cities uh, and in traffic. So the reason they perform really well in traffic is because you have the, the stop, go, stop, go, stop, go constant. So you're not actually using that much power to move it. In addition to that, as you're lifting off or as you're braking, you're using regen to actually uh, recharge the batteries. So that actually helps actually keep, keep the power, uh, the charge levels up and actually sometimes even improve them. Uh, and I have a real world example. I had, a, I think a couple of years ago, I had a mini uh, E on a test. And we drove it out of town, I used up the juice quite quickly and I was like, oh, okay. Um, but then I had to do, I'm in uh, Northwest London, I had to go over to Stratford. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be, you know, and that's a, that's a long haul slog around the North Circular. Going there in the middle of the day in a traffic log A406, I got to Stratford, I'd hardly use like one pip of the battery. I was like, what? I thought I would, like, I would have to find somewhere to charge it to get, to get back. But I got there and it's like, oh, I barely used any. It was incredible. Of course, coming back, it was late at night in the evening and I was uh, enjoying the performance, shall we say. And uh, yeah, I managed to drain the battery much faster. So you see what I mean? So in that sense, it works. Now, that's the use of it. The reality of it is the charging infrastructure is not quite there yet. And that also becomes a problem. So before you commit to an EV, you need to figure out how you're going to charge it. Now, there's two ways, obviously, of charging it. One is public charging, one is home charging. I would strongly recommend that if you're considering an EV, then you should be somebody who has a house and a drive and you're able to install a smart charger. Now, the smart charger has several benefits. It will A, keep your car charged. It will B, uh, choose the best times and the tariffs, depending on which uh, contract you're on or who, which supplier you're on, to get you the best rates for your charging so that you don't have to pay that much. Plus, um, you're not paying tax on that charging. So it's actually quite cheap. So in fact, it actually works out much cheaper to charge, to run an EV on electric charge from home than to run a petrol diesel car or anything else. However, if you have to use public charging, A, first of all, make sure that there is sufficient public charging around you. And just because you live in London, that's not really the case. I live in Northwest London. I have quite a lot of difficulty uh, charging cars because there's nothing actually near me. I live in an apartment, so I can't charge it at home. So I have a problem. Charges around me are limited. They're often not working. And when they are, there's a queue. So it's, then you have to keep these things in mind. Also, you have to keep in mind is that if you are going to use predominantly uh, public chargers, they're more expensive because there's tax on them. And in fact, uh, somebody worked out recently, per mile, using an EV on public chargers alone actually worked out more than uh, driving a petrol car. So, per mile. So, therefore, you just think, oh, okay, well, that's not really going to work out. So, these are the things you've got to consider. So, that's electric cars. What about hybrids? Again, if you have the facility to charge at home, um, you have a, a charger, you have a driveway, you can park the car at home. A lot of the latest plug-in hybrid cars, so these are cars that are hybrid, but you can also plug them in as well. And many of them will come with EV-only range. Anything from 20 up to 40, some of the latest cars up to 60 miles on EV alone. Now we know that in the UK, the average commute for most people is about 30 miles only per day. So think about it in that way, you keep your car uh, plugged in at home and you do your commute, even though it has a petrol or in some cases a diesel engine, it will never use it because it will only use the EV uh, as long as you keep it in EV mode. It will only use the EV because that's all it needs. So therefore that actually makes perfect sense for you. Um, plug it in, drive it as an EV, you never have to put any petrol in it and if you're charging at home, it's cheap energy. So that actually makes a lot of sense. Now. The double advantage of that is that when you do need to, when you have that emergency, somebody was saying to me the other day, um, I was chatting to somebody and they said they had, somebody had an EV, they were very happy with it, they ran it, they enjoyed it, they loved it. 
then they got a call about their parent um, being taken seriously ill in Birmingham, they were in London, and they were like, oh my god, I have to drive up to Birmingham. They had to stop to charge. By the time they got there, said parent had already passed. So there's an example of where, you know, you need that ability to quickly put fuel in something and go. So with a plug-in hybrid, and indeed with any hybrid, obviously it runs on fuel as well. So there you have the immediate advantage. You can go, okay, well, you know, I'm driving it around as an EV, but if I need to suddenly do a long journey or even a planned long journey, I'm not too concerned because I can just put fuel in it. And that's a big advantage. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Are you enjoying the video? Well, make sure you've punched the like button. It helps. Now, the thing to remember about that is that fuel does actually expire. So this is what you've got to remember. Um, I think it's about three months or something like that. So, the, so within the three months period, if you have put fuel in your tank and you find that you're actually only driving it on EV most of the time, then actually you should um, drive the car on petrol. So you should turn the EV mode off and just drive it on petrol so that you're not you know, leaving expired fuel in there, which wouldn't be good for uh, your car. Moving on to hybrids alone, so the, the cars are only hybrids, and even in that you get several different types. You get mild hybrid, which are basically just a normal petrol engine car with some uh, motor battery assistance. And a lot of them, what they do is they use that for A, giving a little bit extra power, a little bit extra oomph to the performance of the vehicle, um, to low, reduce the emissions a little bit, but also to improve the stop-start. Uh, when you stop at the traffic lights, stop-start becomes quicker because it does it on electric motor. So those are actually really good. And some of those are even available as manual cars. So they're still quite enjoyable to drive. So that's actually a really good option if you're an enthusiastic driver, uh, you want something that's a bit economical, a bit cleaner, but you still want a manual gear shift, then you want to look at mild hybrid. Those are the only hybrids that still are available as a manual car. Everything else is virtually automatic or CVT, um, continuous variable transmission, which are not the desired transmission of enthusiasts, although they have got much better in recent years. So in, within hybrids, you've got mild hybrids, you've got regular hybrids, which are basically you know, a combination of the petrol or diesel motor engine and the motor, they work together. They, you don't have to do anything, they take care of everything. Uh, and then also you have, have range extender hybrids. What are range extender hybrids? Range extender hybrids, the best way I can describe them is imagine you have an EV and then you're driving this EV around and in the boot you're carrying a petrol or diesel powered generator. And the generator is there to basically charge your batteries as you're driving along so that you don't have to worry about plugging it in. That's what a range extender fundamentally is. It's a bit more complex than that, but fundamentally that's what it is. A range extender basically is an EV that is carrying an engine around with it as well, which you can put fuel in so that you don't have to worry about plugging it in because the engine will run and it will charge it up. If you, know, if you live in London and you've, you've seen the new London taxis, um, which, you know, Father Khan often says that they're electric taxis. They're not actually electric taxis. They are range extender hybrid taxis. So those are the forms of hybrid that you got. Uh, my favorite at the moment, what I would say is probably the best transitional vehicle for a lot of people right now that makes the most sense is the plug-in hybrid. So that's the one to go for, I reckon, if you're going to go the hybrid route. Can you still go petrol and diesel? Let's tackle diesel first. Diesel is a bit of an issue because diesel sales have fallen off a cliff right now. Diesel is not liked, and it's really a shame because the Euro 6 diesel, the Euro 6 latest, latest version of Euro 6, the cars are cleaner than they have ever been. In fact, um, because of the particulate filters that they've got in it, the air coming out of them is actually cleaner than the air going into them. There's the irony of it, and yet they are the most hated and penalized. Obviously, there were scandals um, and stuff like that. So people have really gone off diesel big time. And even some of the manufacturers traditionally would only offer you SUVs as diesels are, are moving away from it, and now you're only getting petrol. So diesel, however, still remains an option. The diesel will still remain available because obviously commercial transport vans, trucks, etc., lorries, they still use diesel. So diesel will still remain available. And this is the other thing that people ask me, is that will fuel still be available after say 2030, when you know, all new car sales have to be uh, electric? Yes, it will, because although um, the cutoff for selling brand new diesel or petrol cars will be 2030, however, in the UK, we have, over, we have about 40 million cars. We can sell cars maximum in the UK at a rate of 2 million cars a year. So we have currently 1 million, about 1 million uh, electric vehicles on the roads, right? So that still leaves 39 million vehicles. 
39 million vehicles, so you took looking at nearly 20 years to change them. So we are in 2024, five years, another 15. So 2045, I guarantee you, we will still have petrol stations and we'll still have petrol and diesel. Now, there may be fewer petrol stations because what's happening is that as petrol stations are finding that in their area, if more and more people are moving across to electric, then the profitability is dropping and then inevitably those petrol stations will get shut. Um, so there'll be fewer petrol stations and then of course, because there's fewer of them, prices will go up. So fuel is inevitably going to become more expensive. That's the reality of it. Now, there is some uh, hope in that it could be that there is a move towards alternative fuels, synthetic fuels, biofuels, e-fuels. If that picks up, if that, at the moment it's very expensive to produce and uh, very difficult, but I always argue the case, people always say it's not possible because it's so expensive and it's so limited in quantities, but I always argue that it's all about scale, right? Economies of scale. So the moment there's more demand, the moment it needs to be fulfilled, then it will upscale. And when you upscale, then obviously costs come down. So there's still hope there. In any case, I guarantee you that fuel, petrol, and hopefully still diesel will be available. Um, we're talking 2040, 2045. Check this out guys, it's my book, it's my first novel and it's written for car fans like you. It's a fun political action thriller, it's full of cool cars and spectacular action. Get your copy now at Amazon.com. However, having said that, diesel cars are falling out of favour. So, not, in, not only in terms of your initial purchase and your use of the vehicle, but when you think about the resale value of that car, uh, do you want to keep a diesel? I would say maybe go for the petrol car. Petrol, like I said, same story, it will be around for a while. If I've just mentioned resale, you're probably wondering about batteries on an EV, you know, all this talk about. I've just done an article actually for um, a freelance article I've done for EV Life, where I looked at that. And don't forget that virtually every EV comes with an eight year battery warranty. Within that, within that warranty, there's a provision that if the life of the battery drops below 70% within those eight years, the manufacturer has to replace that battery. Batteries cost 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 to replace. But if it drops below 70%, they have to replace it within that warranty. What they are actually finding is the batteries are holding on to uh, 80 plus percent of their uh, capacity, even after 10 years on typical mileage. So the likelihood is that the battery life is actually 15, maybe even 20 years. It depends a lot on how you use the cars, where they use, what kind of stresses they go undergo, etc., etc. Now, Yes, I will grant you that that does present a fundamental problem for the used car market because when you're talking about cars that are say 10, 15 years old and their value is maybe a couple of grand or something like that. However, the batteries are almost gone and at that point you go, well, I'm not going to spend 15, 20, 30,000 pounds to replace a battery on a two grand car. At that point, that car is junk. So that is a problem. I don't have an answer for that. That's going to come later that is going to hit us at some point. However, if you're buying a new car now, you know that second, third owner, that's still not a problem. Initially, a normal uh, change of uh, vehicle cycle is about three years. Three years, you're fine. You, you shouldn't lose too much money on it. Although EVs do suffer heavy depreciation. The best thing right now, if you want to get into an EV, is actually to buy uh, a second, uh, oh, sorry, a, a second-hand one after the first owner. So maybe a two-year-old or a three-year-old EV. It'll still have plenty of life left in it and it will suffer a huge amount of initial depreciation. So you'll save a lot of money on it. And actually, it's the best way to see if that works for you. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is hydrogen vehicles, because that's the other thing that people talk about. There is such a thing, there has been such a thing for a long time. Honda with the Insight and Toyota with the Mirai have been selling them for America, in America for years. I think they actually have just stopped, though. And I think that it's available. I think the Toyota is still available here. I'm not 100% sure, but I think there's only like one or two hydrogen filling stations here. That's the problem. The logistics of it. Again, it's an energy intensive process. The logistics of it, of handling it, of creating it, all the rest of it is actually quite difficult. And so again, the cost of it have put people off. Having said that, hydrogen is not uh, completely to be dismissed right now. I think it's still a technology that Toyota, Porsche and others are banking on. And also the construction industry like JCP and people like that are banking on it. Um, they, and, then, and again, for fleet sales, for freight transport, for those people, it makes a lot of sense because for them, it's a case of, well, um, you know, hydrogen may be difficult to have petrol stations or fuel stations for them, but if they have a depot where they're refueling their vehicles and stuff like that, then actually it makes perfect sense to have all the vehicles uh, fueled up in that one spot um, and then ready for the journey so they can actually handle that. Uh, hydrogen is also being looked at for aviation as well. So hydrogen is not to be dismissed at the moment, but in terms of you and I, 
hydrogen is not really there at the moment. And there is an advantage with hydrogen though. A, because it will run hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which are basically electric vehicles with hydrogen fuel cells, so that you can just refuel it. So it's electric vehicle, drive like an electric vehicle, but you can just refuel it uh, quickly because it's just hydrogen, you can just put it in like petrol, right? Um, and then the other thing that it can actually do is you can actually convert the uh, traditional internal combustion engine, the ICE, to also run on hydrogen, as proven by Toyota with one of the Yaris races, the head of Toyota, Toyota, um, actually raced, um, uh, I think it was a Yaris, um, GI Yaris, that had been converted to run on hydrogen, and it was fine. And it was a, pet it was a combustion engine vehicle. So hydrogen is not to be written off just yet, but it's not something that I can recommend to you just yet, so it's not really there. So your real alternatives really are, I would say, petrol, hybrid, and electric. And as outlined uh, in this video, it all depends on your specific circumstances and what you think is gonna work out best for you. Anyway, I hope this video was useful to you and helpful to you, especially if you're in that point of making a buying choice. Now, I just wanna address one more thing. Um, people often there's some people on my channel that either think i'm anti-ev or think i should be anti-ev i am not anti-ev i'm a car guy i love all cars i don't care what powers them electric uh, diesel petrol hydrogen dilithium crystals star trek fan i don't really care as long as they're good that's what i'm interested in i'm a motoring journalist it is my job to review the latest vehicles out there and to talk about the latest vehicles out there and to advise you the consumer the fan the petrol head the car buyer about what vehicle might be the right one for you this is my job this is what i do so uh, I, I will tell you the benefits i will tell you the downsides so the pros and cons will be discussed but you know i'm not going to go i hate avs or i hate petrol or i hate diesel or i hate hydrogen that just doesn't make any sense. So that's just a complete nonsense. And when it comes to the ethics and stuff of that, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, there are morality issues or whatever. Well, first of all, there's lots of issues regarding that. It's not as simple as people think, plus they apply to everything. So take, for example, a simple case of cobalt, right? Cobalt, we know um, there are serious issues with child labor in the Congo um, with the illegal mines. There are illegal mines, illegal mines. What's happening is in the illegal mines, this is where this is happening. They're trying to eradicate it. They're trying to do something about it. It's still there, a problem. It is still a problem. So you think cobalt, um, we shouldn't be using it, but don't forget that cobalt is actually used in refining petrol as well. So we do actually still need cobalt. Um, so it's not just a case of, oh, we're not gonna buy EVs because that will then stop that problem. Not necessarily. And also when you talk about that, EVs in particular, a lot of the battery manufacturers for EVs are moving away from cobalt in their batteries altogether. And also the battery types are changing within EVs. So at the moment we have lithium ion, we could be having sodium ion, which are better, but also solid state is the next big thing that a lot of people are expecting and thinking that it'll be efficient, it'll be quicker to charge, uh, they will run longer and they will be safer as well. So there's lots of happening and there's lots that I will continue to cover and continue to bring to you. And uh, it's not a case of, you know, me selling out or anything like that, because at the end of the day, if you took, when you use the term sell out, that implies that I'm being paid. I'm not being paid by anybody, right? I freelance, that's the only way I get paid. If you watch my video and you let the ad, ads roll, then I get paid a minuscule amount, uh, which actually doesn't even cover my cost for the Brown Car Guy channel. But th there is no case of selling out. I'm just trying to help people. I'm just trying to bring consumer information advice. That's what I do. That's what I've always done. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you all in the next one.